I'm excited to see what the Chinese mountains are like and experience China for the first time. At 23 years old, she is a veteran of the U.S. ski team, but this is the first time that she will wear the red, white, and blue in the Olympics. Julia, what's it like? How does it feel to be a first-time Olympian? Yeah, it's been a dream come true. As a kid, I dreamed of being an Olympian. I didn't really know what sport at the time. I loved all sports. Um but it's really been a dream come true and a, a lot of years in the making. As you said, I've been, this is my seventh year on the U.S. ski team. Um, and the last Olympics was just a little bit too early for me. So I'm really excited to have just enjoy this journey and experience it for the first time. What was that moment like when you had the realization that you had actually made the team and were going to get to represent the red, white, and blue? Yeah, it's it's kind of funny how our selection process works. We don't have one week trials. We have different criteria to meet. And so it's a accumulation of races throughout the year or me getting a top eight in a World Cup in that exact discipline of an Olympic event. And so I was on track for that, but it wasn't for sure done deal. And then I um, made the finals in a sprint and my teammate looked at me and she goes, did you know you just made the Olympics? And so I think that was really the moment. But I was so focused on the races that I didn't really – um, think about it until after. And my family actually happened to be racing there and I got fourth that race. So it was really special to kind of have that moment sink in with my family there. I think a lot of people will remember the moment from the last Olympic games where Jesse Diggins, who's a partner of yours, she's on the team where she and her partner at the time won the first ever cross country gold at the Olympics for team USA. What are your memories of that moment? Yeah, those memories are extremely vivid for me. Um, I was with my teammate, Hannah Halverson, who actually also made the Olympic team this year. Um, we were in Germany chasing some German races on our own between um, organized trips. And we had an Airbnb and we were screaming at the top of our lungs. I'm pretty sure the whole building was like, who are these crazy <laughs> people in this building? Um, I remember we like delayed our training just to watch. And it was so thrilling. There were happy tears and a lot of screaming and we were so energized for the workout after and um, I've had the pleasure of rooming with Jesse all of last year and this year and so um, it's been really cool to see her achieve that and then actually get to live with her as a friend and teammate um, the last two years in the lead up. We're spending a few minutes with Julia Kern, who is from the U.S. ski team, getting set to head to the Olympic Games to represent the red, white, and blue in cross-country skiing. Uh, and it's so awesome to have her with us here after hours on CBS Sports Radio. What has Jesse said, and what have some of the other who's, who've made the team said to you about what you expect? Yeah, I think um, what's unique about this year is out of the 14 people we're bringing, um, only four are veterans. So it's a really young um, team, but we're really thankful that we do have four veterans on this team with us and Jer Jesse of course carries a lot of Olympic experience and she shared some of that with us um, and I think um, some of the things have just been enjoying enjoying the little incredible moments along the way I know there's a lot of stress amongst our team and as mm -hmm. everyone about COVID and all of the craziness um, of going to a country you've never been but um, I think just remembering that this is a really cool opportunity and making the most of it and having fun with it. And Jessie's really good about that. She wears glitter on race day to remind <laughs> herself that this is a fun thing we get to do and it doesn't need to be all serious pressure. Um, and so I think doing that and then just establishing a normal routine as any other race would be. We're speaking to you while you're in Italy. What happens next now as you get set to head off to the games? Yeah, so we're really close. We're two days away from departing. Um, we're heading to Zurich today, and we have a day or two days of waiting around doing some PCR tests to make sure we get the green light to go to China. And then we have a long flight direct to, to Beijing. And from there, we spend a day processing. And then on Monday, we'll be in China um, and checking out the Olympic courses. I'm super excited to go to a whole new part of the world. Um, we don't normally get to ski race there. To, so to see what the desert um, climate is like there, uh, we're expecting cold environment, but not a lot of natural snow. Um, so I'm excited to see what the Chinese mountains are like and experience China for the first time, because there's not always a chance we get to travel to that country.
I'm glad you brought up snow conditions, Julia, because I didn't do a lot of skiing when I was younger, but growing up in New Hampshire, pretty much everyone skied. And I know my favorite type of conditions were the pure powder. I loved it. What type of conditions, weather and snow, do you prefer? Yeah, I mean, if I'm alpine skiing, I also prefer powder day. But for Nordic skiing, um, for races, I, I prefer um, fast man-made snow. That's what I grew up skiing on, on the Weston um, ski track, the golf course in West in Weston, Mass. So that was a lot of man-made snow in the Boston suburbs. And so I really like the fast um, man-made snow because I'm really comfortable with that. And it makes r- uh, racing really fast. Um, for training, I love a good uh, powder day too, where you're just skiing through the deep snow, but that tends to slow down the track on race day. <laughs> I've seen a bunch of your videos where you're on skis And you're either holding a phone up and taking a video. I don't know how you do that because it takes all my focus to not fall (laughs) over. Do you have those epic wipeouts that the rest of us can relate with? Oh, for sure. Um, Most definitely. Um, Yeah, we we, we get really comfortable on our skis, uh, but maybe sometimes too comfortable. And in races, there's definitely some crashes or a lot of times what you don't see is how we how we fall and pull ourselves or that's what what's what training is for. How is cross-country skiing a team sport, Julia? Because I think most people think of it as an individual activity that you do. Um, if a great exercise, obviously, it requires a, you know, all the muscles in your body. It's exhausting. But how is it a team sport? Uh, I'm glad you asked that because I think one of the strengths of our team is that we are very team-oriented or- for an individual sport. It's not as typical as you would maybe expect, but um, one of the things our team – prides ourselves in is um having a team mindset and so that is we each push each other in training to make each other brother and that that can't happen always without teammates it's a lot harder to get out every day without teammates pushing you in every workout mm. um, and then also it takes a team even on race day waxing our skis is a really big part of our sport and we have a massive wax team who just dedicates their entire winter to prepping our skis testing the waxes finding the best skis we have coaching staff We're out on course, giving us race splits, handing us spare poles when we do break poles, um, or handing us feeds in a longer race. So it really takes a whole team to make it happen. And um, then when it comes to relay day, team sprint day, any kind of team event day, our team really comes together and brings out the best performances when they're representing not just themselves, but the whole team. Now, you have a background in basketball. You kind of draw on that, recognizing how it takes everybody really to to produce a winner, a champion? Yeah, I definitely. I always loved playing team sports growing up um, because I love the aspect of being with others. Many people know that um, when I'm skiing, I really don't prefer to train alone or ski alone. Um, I always prefer to have someone with me. And I think having people to push you, make you better and support you on the harder days is um, really important. And I think those little things add up to individual successes that the whole team is a part of, not just the individual. Okay. This is going to sound like a dumb question, but how do you train when there's no snow, Julia? Yeah, that's a, that's not a dumb question. That is a great (laughs) question. Um, We do this activity called roller skiing a lot in the summer and fall, which is imitate skiing on snow, but on pavement. Um, you can envision it as uh, roller blades, but a little bit longer. And so they're about two feet long, two to three feet long. Um, we have both skate and classic roller skis that we can ski with our poles on pavement up and down hills to imitate skiing. And we're fortunate, unlike alpine skiing, um, roller skiing actually can imitate skiing on snow really well. And so we don't have to be on snow training all year. And so that's what we do majority of the summer and fall. I'm based out of Vermont with my professional club team, SMST2. And so that's what a lot of our uh, summer and fall training consists of. Interesting. Julia Kern of the U.S. ski team is about to head to China for her first Olympic Games. And we're so excited to have her with us here after hours on CBS Sports Radio. I watched the video of you and Jesse when you were in Dresden, Germany. So not I guess it was, what, a month ago, a month and a half ago? So I don't know a ton about racing in this format, but I did see that Jesse fell, and so there was kind of this wipeout with another competitor, and also that you had to come from behind on the final lap or the final leg. What was that experience like to actually come from behind to get on the podium to get to finish second, but also to to see your teammate have to 
figure out a way to go through that adversity and kind of make up for what happened. Yeah. I mean, if there's anyone who would I trust more and believe in more to come back from a crash in a race, it's, it's Jesse. Um, she never gives up. And honestly, um, it happened in the semifinals. So when it happened in the finals again, I almost, I laughed a little bit because I said, okay, <laughs> we did it last time. We can do it again. And um, this kind of lit the fire in ourselves to really get going in the final round. So um, I love the Dresden team sprint. I've done it. This was my fifth year doing it. It's chaotic. There are crashes everywhere. You're tagging every lap. It's tight, fast, man-made snow, and it's absolutely chaotic. But I think it's so fun because you just feel like you're a little bit on a circus wheel, um, just going faster and faster every <laughs> lap. And um, I think that's really exciting. And so, um, like I said, with Team Relays, we're all putting our best foot forward even more so because we're fighting for the team. And so it was really exciting and rewarding to come back from that and finish with a podium. Some athletes say they don't really think or feel a whole lot if they're in those moments where they're performing at their best or in, in a final lap like that where you're coming from behind. So you literally passed another skier. Do you remember maybe adrenaline or emotions in that moment as, as you're tracking down the, the second place skier in front of you? Um, I actually do remember it quite vividly because I was feeling so good and I was like, okay, I'm ready to make my move. But because it's a city sprint and the track is so tight, I noticed the girl in front of me trying to push me out. She could sense I was coming on. And um, th there was a moment where I was pushing over those bumps and I couldn't even skate because I was getting almost pushed off the trail, but <sighs> I was so determined to pass her. And I was feeling like I had that finishing kick that um, I was just waiting for the trail to open up so I could make my the final move and the finishing straight away. Is that legal? Is it legal to bump or impact other skiers? <laughs> um, let's, we would call it a gray area. If you're in front, <laughs> you can choose your line without obstructing another person. But uh, in a city sprint like that, um, it's a gray area that unless you're clearly taking someone out, um, it's just part of the game. Wow. So has it happened to you or the reverse? Have you ever... I don't want to say accidentally, but ever taken a competitor out in the course of an event? Um, I'm not sure if I have. I mean, there's tactical positioning um, to position yourself in a way to protect your space. But just the day before in that team sprint, I was quite frustrated because I had felt I was getting exactly that um, pushed out. But it's part of it is just protecting your own space and knowing where people want to go and taking up that space. And so I think that's part of ski racing as frustrating as it can be um but also when you're in the position where you have that liberty then that's part of skiing smart amazing julia kern from U the u.s ski team team usa is with us here after our cbs sports radio i don't want to keep you too much longer you've been so generous with your time thank you what happens when you get to the game how many times do you race and and uh, how does it go when you're in between race days yeah, so there's, I think, a total of six or seven cross-country events, and they're spread out through the entire game. So cross-country starts on day one and ends on the last day. And so um, we have quite a bit of racing throughout the period. And um, in terms of what races or how many races I will do, I don't know yet. Um, a lot of it gets determined race by race, depending on how people are racing, the conditions, how people are feeling. And so um, we prepare for certain races, our target races, and are ready to race um, if the opportunity comes up. But it's uh, very much day by day. And I think that's going to be part of the Olympic journey is preparing. Um, and there's always a few days in between each race. And so you have some time to recover and prepare for the next one. When I spoke to Olympians and different athletes who were participating in the last summer games, there was the added stress uh, with COVID and the virus, but also the fact that a lot of the athletes who would normally have had their families with them weren't able to have that experience. But how much <laughs> extra pressure, maybe stress, anxiety does it add to your team and to you personally, knowing that you're going into a situation where there aren't a ton of spectators and your family maybe can't be with you the way that you would have hoped? Often people expect there to be an insane amount of spectators, but when the Olympics are in more remote countries or a uh, different time zone, it's actually my expectation was never to have a ton of spectators. We often get more spectators on world cups, what I've been told at least. And it's definitely a bummer not to have my family there, but um, they get to go to this watch party organized by team USA in park city. Aww. And they're really excited about that. So 
I think having them experience it in some way makes me happier than having to um, not experience it at all. And um, for me, I'm really just focused on performing well. And I know people will be cheering back home, watching on the television. And in the end, just having people support me is what matters. And um, on race day, I'm focused and in the zone anyway. And so it's definitely a bummer, but I think having a safe and healthy games is our priority. Of course. And, and I've heard from other athletes that at this point, with some of the uncertainty that was out there, even with these games, again, they're just so grateful that the games are moving forward or their events are moving forward, that you take them and you compete however they come. Yeah, exactly. I think just getting there and competing is in the end the goal. Um, and anything on top of that is a bonus. <laughs> Just before I let you go, I want to ask you this, uh, because there are a lot of people who listen who ski. What is your favorite thing about skiing itself? My favorite thing about skiing, I would say, is um, being active outside with others and sharing that experience and love for the outdoors. Um, what I love about all the outdoor sports and especially skiing is that it's a way to be active outside in the winter and a way to be social. And that's what kind of grew my love for skiing in the beginning. It was, I skied with a bunch of my friends outside and we would play games on skis or travel from hut to hut and drink hot chocolate. And so for me, what I love about skiing is just moving through nature and enjoying being outside with others. Oh, you make it sound so blissful. Like there's no stress or <laughs> really sore muscles involved at all, Julia. <laughs> It can be quite blissful, I think, and really fun. Um, and I think that people should give it a try and give it a few tries because it might be daunting at first, but I promise it's super fun, especially if you get a group of people um, out there and, you know, reward yourself with some hot chocolate after. Yes. Oh, that sounds perfect. That'll appeal to so many people. Well, because our show airs overnight, late night in the United States, we actually get to watch a lot of these events live. So we'll be looking for you and for the US ski team. But congratulations, Julia, on not only making your first Olympics, but getting to experience this and represent the red, white, and blue. And it's so great to not only to meet you, but to spend a few minutes with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.